so nice. All right, everyone's so nice and patient here. I'm used to architecture events, you know, where everyone's competitive with each other and kind of snarky about each other's slides in the back, you know. Um, <laughs> so th this is great. I want to come here all the time. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about reparations and speculating, and hopefully it'll pick up on some things that, that – because it's been exciting to hear other people, and I think one of the questions that stuck with me is how can we make that speculative dimension work for us in a different kind of way? And I'm sorry, I don't know who said it. It was some, some, someone on the earlier panel. Um, so that's, that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, reparations, obviously, folks have been – Tony C. Coates wrote an amazing piece for The Atlantic a few years ago that I think um, got reparations into a broader conversation. Conversation. Also, I had the very good, um, uh, I was lucky enough to be roommates with Sharifa Rhodes Pitts in college, who's been writing about black utopias in her work, Harlem is Nowhere, and, and the kind of cataloging of the politics on the ground has been inspiring me. Um, but also, um, w it's important to note that in terms of working on urbanism and space, that there have been folks like W.B. Du Bois doing uh, work that is already speculative on the page. I mean, the, these kind of drawings that were just recently, um, you know, kind of archived digitally, which makes them more open, um, you know, are these kind of diagrams that I think when you're looking at the rural population and it kind of spirals like that, then the drawings are already speculating, right? The drawings are already doing that work of asking you, what about the potential energy there where these, the, you know, black America in the South wants to be a kind of spring, right? Kind of popping off the Z dimension on the page there. Um, and so, you know, and then thinking about, yeah, this is this kind of like dramatic shift of, of freedom in the 19th century, and that's a kind of speculation um, in real life. So I want to I want to connect that to some of the questions that were asked today, um, in terms of what would the mutant do. Um, I think I think a, I think a Du Bois speculative diagram like this already asked, what would the mutant do? Um, rethinking the past in a new framework, right? I think that that that's work that happens that that, that we do in different activist moments, but that I, that that architecture also participates in. And that's a tricky thing to say in this country. Um, you know, modernism as an architectural movement really came from working with socialists, planners and architects working with socialists, right? Um, and so I think when we talk about the 21st century and the work that architecture needs to be doing in technology, we're talking about architects working with activists, working with, um, with the kind of thinkers who are in this room in a way before the answer of what's the building, what's the site, and what's the money comes together. Um, and, and one of the thinkers that I like to rely on to, to do that architecturally is Lefebvre. Lefebvre talks about how space is already social, how there's no difference between something like um, uh, a mathematical space a scientific space and a social space, that, that once we're in the mode of space, then that means that things are already flowing and it means it's already societal and social. And I like to, 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 to work in a way, I mean, this is just, this is not even a drawing, this is just kind of like when you open up a computer and you start working on drawings, the way that a line emerges, that, that how a line operates is already computational. Um, you know, we call computers computers, we don't call them geometers. There's a lot of things that computers are designed to do that are already within the realm of accounting and things like that, um, that they, they're very good at adding things up. They're actually not that good at, um, at working with geometry. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually glad about that um, because it, it opens up ways of working kind of a, against the logic of accounting and tables and things like that, which I think it relates to some of the conversations that we've heard. So today what I'm going to do, this was just a kind of a quick introduction in terms of like what architects do in the 21st century, how I think about that. Um, this is one of the places that I work on campus. These are some of my students working with robots. I voted against the robot doing the bath because I'm working on, you know, building a chair and walls with robots, but I would not trust these robots to bathe anybody. Um, and that could be a whole different talk about why that is. Um, but so what I'm going to do with these 10 minutes that I have really is talk about three projects. Um, one is really kind of a research project that I call Watercraft. Um, the second one is a, is a speculation that's a collaboration with municipal um, geospatial data that I call Methexis. And then the third one, <clears throat> we'll just see what it is. I'm blanking on what it is right now. Um, okay, so so this is really, this is the moment when Flint um, switched, you know, they, 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 they hit the switch and they decided that they would, uh, the folks in this room who are not democratically elected uh, would poison the people of, Fran of Flint. And, and they're celebrating because it wasn't something to hide at the time, right? So I, I wanted, so this research 
project Watercraft. I was living in Michigan, and I was really wanting to understand how is it that that, that could happen, but also how could that be connected to what was happening on the ground in Detroit, um, where people were getting their water shut off. And what does that mean spatially, and, and what does that open up as a way of, of working spatially against those kind of things, uh, against that celebration of turning the switch? And what I started to locate was this vast kind of early smart city that started in the 1960s that's underground and has a lot of different uh, water pumps involved. And this early imagination of Michigan as this, this water wonderland in the middle of the Great Lakes, and that it, it was meeting a reality on the ground where people were protesting and reaching out to the UN about getting evicted from their houses because their water bills were too high. And what I started to locate was that there's this story that hasn't been told in the same way that the story of highways has been told, um, where highways, if we know anything about the suburbs and white flight and how it leads to fossil fuels, um, you know, kind of addiction, that, that the highways were a vehicle, a uh, kind of mechanism, a kind of technology that enabled white flight. Well, uh, sewer lines also were. Right, And so what that means is that here you have in 1966, George Ramos is this uh, figure in, uh, in municipal water in, in Michigan. He's basically the Robert Moses of water. This, this, he, what he started to set up in the 1960s is a system that delivers water and takes sewage from over three million people. And no one knows his name. Um, so, you know, the, the population around Detroit kept climbing, right? So we're talking about three million people and all the sewage is processed in this one place in Detroit. So until Mexico City is building a giant sewer plant right now, and there's one in Saudi Arabia, but other than those two, this was the largest sewage processing facility in the world until just recently. Um, and, and these, this is where I'm kind of hacking the, the, the municipal data a little bit in this watercraft project to, to start to look at, can we even see the lines of, of kind of subsidy where this Detroit resource is actually enabling not just the white flight, but the wealth of these McMansions and, and the kind of security of not having sewage um, flow up in the basement, which I will actually show you a little bit. Um, and so what that means for folks on the ground in Detroit is not just uh, water evictions, but also CSO, right? So climate change doesn't hit everybody the same way. Um, so now there, when, it, when it rains, um, the Belle Isle and these beautiful waters around Detroit um, have combined sewer overflow issues. <clears throat> this is me kind of repurposing, uh, I have to give credit to the Canadian government who set up a, a, a basic drawing so that I could understand what's there and then redraw it specifically for Detroit. Um, but for the suburban area, the infrastructure basically works like this, where there's um, a, a sewer main and then there's a storm sewer, right? And so even if it's raining a lot, the storm sewer will catch that water and, and the sanitary sewer um, doesn't, doesn't flood the suburban basements. In Detroit, you have the one combined sewer, and so you get, you get a lot of issues in addition to the combined sewer overflow. I'm working on a waterfront site right now in East Detroit. We're regularly, th this is basically, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to draw what's happening in this neighborhood, where um, people have sewage come up into their basements. And it's not their sewage. It's literally white people's shit. Okay. <laughs> Um, so how do you deal with that? How do you deal with white people's shit? Um, I think that's a question of reparations. Um, I'm going to show you more. Oh, that's what we end with, sorry, is the speculative reparations, a collaborative workshop that I did in Pittsburgh. Um, but so just looking at basements, basements themselves can be repurposed. They can become nodes that start to, um, you know, especially when not all the houses are occupied as houses. Um, also, just in terms of uh, design strategy, working in a, in a broad field. Uh, this is a studio that I taught at Michigan where each student used algorithms to design not one house, but 99 houses. And they listen to Jay-Z a lot. Um, but, but kind of zooming into a map like this, um, this is the Methexis where it's a collaborative uh, kind of script that I'm still working on that takes municipal data and then speculates on what exists. And I think that's part of the work that needs to be done is speculating on what's already happening. And, and, and I, I mean that because I take seriously what was said that facts won't save us. But I think there are so many things happening that are so bizarre, right, that we need a speculative dimension to even face what exists. Uh, so this is a set of algorithms that takes those footprints and, and speculates on what's already there, um, both in terms of what might be uh, not there, in terms of the kind of typical 
um, building systems of certain time periods, um, but also looking already at these voids that might do some of that water catchment I was talking about in basements and purposely be kind of fuzzy in their logic, um, that, that, that the speculativeness can team up with a kind of fuzzy logic. So this was the first exhibition of Mephexis in, in Detroit. And, and, you know, obviously virtual reality is there. I think this, the, at the time this was hooking into another exhibit, but what this got me interested in was putting that kind of, um, that adjacency of speculating on what exists next to speculating on what might be. Right, so then what I'm gonna close with is speculating on what might be. This moves to Pittsburgh, but where my, I'm, I'm interested in collapsing these things together um, and thinking across, um, across places, because I think we share so many, so many issues. Um, so in Pittsburgh, this was a workshop that I did called This Is What We Will Build When We Get Our Reparations. Um, and, and this was at the Asylum, Society of Asylum, it's a, it's, a, it's a place where a few dozen people from Pittsburgh showed up to think about this, um, think about this together, what we will build when we get our reparations. And I like to think of this, that this can be a continuation of um, rethinking the past and the new framework. Um, I think also related to the talk about video games, right, that the environment as a backdrop, I would say actually that that can be uh, a little bit how the environment plays out in terms of our political rhetoric, where the environment becomes a kind of backdrop or a kind of antagonist maybe, right? There's a, there's a fossil environment that's an antagonist or then there's an existing environment that's a backdrop. How do we make the environment part of the terms that we're speculating in? Um, so here this workshop took the kind of conventional terms of a, of a charrette, like one of these sort of cheesy, um, you know, you got your scissors and paper and kind of make your neighborhood different. But instead of just focusing on a kind of provincial idea of a neighborhood, um, we started with questions that we're really asking about, okay, we have reparations, what are we gonna do in terms of health? What is that gonna mean in terms of what's really gonna change in terms of employment? And people had these really big um, ideas and I'm still working on drawing them together. Um, but, but I realized that this, there was a scale shift. And so I started, I then kind of remixed the collages together. Um, and just to walk you through, I'm gonna close walking you through uh, just the, the, what, what's happening here. One is a kind of employment uh, training area. Another is a center for queer people of color that also is doing some work around waterways in, in Pittsburgh and, and, and something about this kind of bridge that circles on itself. And then the one I'm gonna show you is, is dealing with, um, instead of talking about gentrification, talking about kind of nestling in hills that are threatened by, um, by this kind of class conflict. Um, and, and so this kind of nestling in these hills, um, I'm now thinking of them in relationship to the, the, the water in those basements, but, but really that it becomes a kind of provocation of thinking of if we do have the wealth and the resources to continue to occupy the spaces where we've been telling our stories, then how does that change the environment around us and the rules, the basic rules between something like building and a hill between interior and ground? All right, thank you.